D is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him were created all things in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible. Where the thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he himself might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile all things for him, making peace by the blood of his cross. Through him, whether those on earth or those in heaven, the word of the Lord. Thanks. 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 Yeah. And then some of the passage in Ephesians chapter 1, 8, B, and following. In all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will, in accord with his favor that he set forth in him, as a plan for the fullness of time, to sum up all things in Christ, in heaven and on earth. In him, we were also chosen, destined in accord with the purpose of the one who accomplishes all things according to the intention of his will, so that we might exist to the praise of his glory, we who first hoped in Christ. In him you also, who have heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and have believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, which is the first installment of our inheritance toward redemption as God's possession to the praise of his glory. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you again for being here. I'm Father John Dowling from the Diocese of Knoxville, and I've been invited to come and talk to you about conscience. And I'm originally from Savannah, Georgia, and so people in Tennessee don't claim me, and people in Ohio where I went to seminary, they wondered uh, where I was from, they knew I wasn't from the north. But I'm glad to be here in Atlanta. My mom uh, was, she dated one of the priests here in this city before he was a priest. <laughs> In Savannah, Georgia, Johnny Stapleton, and he was a pastor at St. Jude. Uh, my sister <laughs> attends St. Jude now, but sent her three girls to the school. First time I've ever been in school. And I think among those three girls, they were in soccer, swimming, and track. And among the three of them, they were on 12 teams that won the state championship. So it's a powerhouse there apparently in sports. Um, I won't get upset or be offended if you fall asleep during this talk since I fell asleep prepared. <laughs> so it's, pretty, it's pretty heavy stuff. But I wanted to read those passages from scripture because I wanted this to be Christ-centered because conscience can seem kind of out there and uh, detached and uh, but the reason we have conscience is so that we can be fulfilled in Christ. That God wants to sum up everything in Jesus Christ. And that's why I read those two passages because, indeed, for me, they are very plain in communicating to us uh, the heart of the gospel, which is everything is going to be restored in Jesus Christ. And our conscience is part of salvation history. It's necessary. In fact, the four transcendentals that they talk about in philosophy truth, goodness, unity, and beauty. Those are necessary. God creates us, even before we have the gift of faith, we have to be able to be open as creatures to truth, goodness, unity, and beauty. And of course, Jesus Christ possesses those to the max. But unless we were open to that, then God really couldn't judge us accountable for failing to respond to the one who is true, the one who is holy and good the one who unifies God and man in his very person, the one, indeed, who calls us to the theistic vision. And so that's why I want to make sure that conscience is never a subjective thing in the sense that uh, it's detached from objective truth, and that's what we're going to try to get into, and I hope you have a lot of questions. I hope I don't get too bogged down in any one particular uh, aspect of this because there's so much to it, and I certainly can bog people down, uh, but hopefully if that happens, you can uh, take a little snooze. And so that reading from Colossians, just to refresh your memory, 
in he is the in image of the invisible God. Image of the invisible God. When I think about image of God, in St. Thomas Aquinas, the image of God, St. Thomas would say, we have we image God as individuals. That's what his focus was. And he was correct. But he limited himself to that. We image God in our intellect. God knows everything. And we reflect God's knowledge by the fact that we have an intellect. Also, God is free. He creates perfectly, freely, joyfully. And we have a will. And that enables us to choose freely. So, Jesus Christ is that image that in the Bible, he is the image of God. But St. Thomas focuses on individual imaging, individuals imaging the Trinitarian God. Jesus is the image of the Father. He's not the image of the Holy Spirit. He's the image of the Father. So when we say Jesus is the image of God, think Father. He who has seen me, Philip, has seen the Father. And that's our goal, is the beatific vision, to be able to see God in the face. And it's only through Jesus Christ that we arrive there. And I'll go a little bit of a sign because I, I think the Lord gave me a, a clue one time. When people ask about Christianity and they, well, why is it so unique? What, what's so unique about Christianity? Well, besides the fact of what I've just read, that we are, were created uh, through him, in him, and with him, and for him. Wow. For him. The whole created reality, the whole cosmos is because of Jesus Christ, who's going to sum up everything, transform everything in the new heavens and the new earth. But thinking about why is it, and I hope this is not inaccurate, because I've never really heard anyone else say this, so it's, it's likely that it could be on the, on the edge. But God the Father from all eternity begets a son. We say that in the Creed, the Nicene Creed every Sunday. God from God, light from light, through God from true God. But if Jesus Christ is the eternal Son of God, the only way that we are able to call God Father is because, or the primary way, we call him Father because he creates and he Father because of grace. But he's primarily Father since he didn't need to create us. He's primary Father in relationship to his eternal Son. His Son is eternal because the, the Son eternally reflects to the Father his fatherhood. So God the Father cannot even understand his own identity. Even though he is father from all eternity, he does not have fatherhood in isolation from the Son. In other words, he does not have an identity without the Son. Okay? Would you, would you think that's true? Mm -hmm. Okay. Usually people don't put it that way. I, I believe that's true. The fatherhood of God. Without the Son, there is no fatherhood of God. But if the Father cannot come to understand who He is, detached from the Son, then neither are human beings ever going to be able to understand who they are, detached from the Son. God the Father wills to create human beings in such a way that they're, going to, they're only going to come to understand who they are because of Jesus Christ. That's it. That's the centrality of Jesus Christ. So when we make excuses for and apologize for this and talk about everybody's equal and all that, uh, besides the fact that conscience can't handle everybody's thoughts and choices are equal to everybody else's, that is absurd. But what is more important than that being absurd is the positive dimension of conscience, which tells us that we are made for someone. We made so for someone. And we are constituted in that way to where we can know the truth that will set us free, and that truth is not simply rules, that's for sure. Not even doctrine, although that's part of salvation, but it's the person of Jesus Christ. That's what it's all about, the person of Jesus Christ. And Catholics need to really be formed in the, in the gospel and re, be rooted in the understanding of Jesus Christ as being absolutely the way, the truth, the life, with the emphasis on the uniqueness and the uniqueness of Jesus Christ. So, in the scripture, Jesus is the image of God, meaning he's the image of the Father. That's one way to say a human is in the image of God. Another way is to say, again, as St. Thomas Aquinas 
we image God in our intellects and in our wills. We are stewards. God created, and we're called to share in his creative powers, procreative powers, and also we are to be stewards of the world. Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over it. Da -da 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 -da. So all these ways Thomas talked about, love, God loves, humans can love. We're free, we can know things, we are students. John Paul, Pope John Paul, St. Pope John Paul, he took it in another way, not that he denied what Thomas said, or certainly doesn't deny what scripture says about Jesus, but he takes it in a way that male and female he created it. And Pope John Paul II, basically, first one that really highlighted this, that man, meaning humans, and they come in two perspectives, male and female, they together as a couple, as two distinct beings, each of whom is 100% human, but gives witness to a different perspective how human is to be expressed. That couple, male and female, that duo, images God in the body, in the body. That was never said by St. Thomas. As smart as he was, and certainly is today. So we, when you think of image of God, we haven't been focusing so much on Jesus as being the image of God. And that is what theology needs to do, is it needs to get more concrete about what, not primarily individuals who are a plague, but it's primarily Jesus who is the image of God, and then we imitate Jesus. Love one another as I have loved you. Forgive as the Lord has forgiven you. Be perfect as my Heavenly Father is perfect. Jesus is, he gives access to the Father. So that's just the beginning, because both of those talk in various ways about the image of God and what we're called to do that. So why don't we open these little booklets here, and uh, maybe go down and hopefully, we have any questions so far? Yes? You need a booklet. That's an easy one. I remember a, a class we had in the seminary, and this teacher was very red-faced, not because he was angry, just red-faced, he had all these jackets on and everything, and he was really like that, he was pretty intelligent. And, but this one fellow never asked questions. We get into controversy, never ask any <laughs> questions, ever. And we'd be challenging this, and what about that, and what about that? And I noticed, no, I never asked a question. And finally, every, all the windows, everything was closed. It was he heating up, and this priest's face was really, really red. Now I was about to sweat out. And finally, this kid, kid raised his hand, and after he, this priest had said something so uh, you know, controversial that I was thinking, okay, everybody's got to have a question here. And finally, the kid raised his hand. Joe, can we open up a window in here? <laughs> <laughs> no. Any more questions? <laughs> no. Anyway, that's all right. So uh, maybe that's the toughest question I'm going to get today. Uh, but let's kind of look at this and uh, go through it. I didn't know how else to do it. My sister said, don't read or speak too fast. So we're trying to do this. We're at page one. First of all, conscience. You can find it in the catechism. But I don't want to copy a lot of things from the catechism down here. But it's in paragraph 1776 to 1802. That makes 17 little paragraphs in the Catechism. If you want to write that down, 1776 to 1802. The paragraph numbers, not page numbers. And what does conscience mean? With knowledge, knowing with, knowing with, knowing with what? Knowing with God and knowing with others. So our conscience is tapped into God and is tapped into others. The title of this is Conscience, Our Voice or God's, or you can have God's voice or ours. Because that intrigued me, because I'd hear people talk about conscience being God's voice. It's God's voice. To be honest with you, I thought, wait a minute, conscience, wait a minute. How many think that your conscience could be wrong, ever? Raise your hand if you think conscience can be wrong. Okay, well conscience can be wrong, it's not infallible. So I thought, well, I know conscience can be wrong. People make mistakes. Sometimes through their own fault, sometimes not. But conscience can be in error. But God's voice, God tempts no one, the Bible says. So how can God's voice and conscience be identified perfectly? Well, I'm going to tell you right off the bat, it can't. But it is God's voice in some way. And that's what intrigued me about this. Is that, well, how can people, the way, very intelligent, 
John Henry Cardinal Henry Newman, John Henry Newman, uh, he spoke eloquently about conscience, and he said it was God's voice. But Pope Benedict said you can't identify conscience with God's voice, and both are true. It depends on how you understand conscience, and I hope it doesn't confuse you. I hope some of this uh, material, the reason I had it down was because I could remember it, number one, number two, you maybe be able to take it home and uh, go over it, or even if we don't get through it. So, one of the few remaining moral truths recognized by society is that we must obey our conscience or follow our conscience. Even those who have little regard for making morally upright choices oftentimes make reference to following their conscience. Have you ever heard that before? I just follow my conscience. I mean, even people that you say, well, you're not even, why do you even throw that out there? I don't even, I've never seen you go to church or pray a bit. A bit. But you, yeah. it's my conscience, I'll do what I want. Okay. But the obvious question is, why? Why must a person follow his or her conscience? Who died and left conscious thoughts? I mean, seriously, everybody wants to ask that. I mean, and here's the second paragraph. If a person is composed of body and soul, then surely a person's conscience does not fully equate with or express who a person is, much less possess a superior status. I mean, it's your conscience. I've never heard anybody say that <coughs> they don't worship their conscience. They don't say that I'm part of a conscience, that my conscience is greater than I am. Persons possess consciences. Consciences don't possess persons. If you ever hear anybody says, consciences possess persons, you want to stop that conversation, kind of move on from that person. All right, it's just, nobody says that. So you have to wonder, well then if, so why are we, what do we owe, what do we owe to conscience? Why do we have to follow it? The reason our conscience does not create truth, but discovers it. That, that's pretty much it. That's not the whole reason. But why do we have to follow it? Because although it's not greater than we are, in the sense that it doesn't create truth, and neither do we, we submit to the truth. But why do we submit to conscience? And why do we submit to truth by submitting to conscience? Because conscience is connected to God. Natural law. We're going to talk about that. Okay. So, our conscience discovers truth. It doesn't make it. That's the whole story about Adam and Eve and uh, from the fruit of the tree. Basically, did God really tell you that? He really, he really told you that? Well, that basically is the, the fruit of the tree is the one forbidden fruit. Why is that? Because God wants us to know. But it's saying, as Pope John Paul II basically is saying, is the poetry there, the imagery there, is trying to explain a, a profound truth, which is human beings do not create truth. They receive it. They submit to it. And, of course, we know Jesus is going to become that fruit of the tree off the cross. And he's going to be the Eucharistic Lord. And he is the Eucharistic Lord. And we're going to get fed from that tree of the cross, the tr cross and the Last Supper united. And the fruit from the tree is Jesus, and we do become gods in the early church. God became man in order that man might become God. Now, I'm not polytheist, uh, but what I am saying is we share God's divine life. We share God's divine life. We receive Jesus at baptism, first of all, but then throughout our life. And we can grow in God's grace. We have God's genes in the sense that we become children of God. There's only one God, but we actually participate through adoption. We're adopted children, adopted sons and daughters of God. So, the obligation we intuitively and instinctively have to follow our conscience derives from two facts. It is our conscience. And I ask my two secretaries. Do you understand this? It's, it's our conscience, and so you always have to follow your conscience. In fact, it's impossible, impossible, to follow somebody else's conscience. Mm -hmm. And they said, huh? Well, what if you get an expert and then knows more way to, no, you can get an expert, but even if you get an expert and you know nothing about what the person's talking about, you say, I need to know that information, I got a test, I know nothing about it, I got a pass, or a driver says nothing, take anything. 
You're an expert. You've given this test. Tell me what I need to know. I know nothing about it. I don't know how many questions or anything else. Okay, good, good, good. I'll take your word for it. I'll take your word for it. I'm following my conscience. Yeah. Yeah? It is impossible to follow somebody else's conscience, even if you know nothing about what that person just told you. Because in the end, you have to make a choice. Okay, I'm not going to ask anybody else. This is going to be good enough. Or, even though he might not be the greatest expert, he's better than I am. I'm going to go with it. I don't have time to check with anybody else. Okay? So, that's, that's one reason you have to follow your conscience, because it's impossible to follow anybody else. That's one reason. That's kind of an obvious reason. And, although there are many ways that God can speak to us, any morally significant response on our part must somehow involve our conscience. So we can have a, a we can have a response if the doctor hits us on the knee and tries to see what our reflex is on. That's a response it didn't involve our conscience, but it's not morally significant. Okay. So, he, and maybe somebody can enlighten me on this, but I couldn't think of any way that God, in history, speaks to us through Scripture, through prayer through meditation, through uh, in, in any kind of visions of that, without being required of us to use our conscience. We cannot know God's will apart from an act of conscience. Impossible. Okay? So, we have to follow our conscience because God speaks to us through the conscience. It's very important. And that's why conscience is can judge us, not because it's greater than God or independent of God, but because it is God speaking through the conscience. But he doesn't speak, he doesn't speak in every aspect through the conscience. Conscience is kind of multi-layered in a way, and then we're going to get into that. And that's the confusion I think that people have about conscience being God's voice or human reasoning. Which is it? Well, it's both. Because there are different aspects of conscience. And the most profound level of conscience, the deepest level, called natural law, is God's voice. Because you can't be wrong about the practical about practical reasoning that we have. All human beings, if you're a rational human being, if you're rational, I'm being serious about that, then you cannot not know certain things in the moral realm. It's impossible. And that's the veil behind which God speaks to us, natural law. But conscience is when we apply basic fundamental truths that all human beings are aware of and cannot be ignorant of to particular circumstances. Then it gets a little bit more murky, and then we can begin to make decisions that are not 100% accurate because we ask the wrong people, or we don't pray enough, or we don't read scripture enough, or we don't, we're playing too many games, whatever the case is. And then there's finally, we come to conscience as a moral judgment after we've gone from the basics to working with conclusions. We've got all kinds of options out there, what should I do now? Should I give money to the poor, or should I take somebody out to eat a chocolate sundae with them? I've got extra money, what should I do with it? We go on vacation, uh, or do I have a vocation to go out and uh, be a missionary? Uh, what do I do with all this extra money? Do I save it because I want to be? All kind of options in life. There's where we can start to make mistakes. Uh, some again, tell the candle, some not. Any questions so far? Nothing, nothing positive. Okay. Okay. Um, conscience is one thing, again. So if you're thinking, I've got to follow my conscience. But why? Well, then you have to, it, it really does speak. If you believe you follow your conscience, then you can't believe that your conscience is greater than you are, but at the same time, you believe that you've got to follow it. So you've got to see God beyond that. I mean, where does this, the source of this obligation come from? And yet we know it's not as great as we are, but we know we're going to be judged by it. Or, even if we don't use those terms. There's another thing that's very similar. Conscience has to deal not only with your mind, not only with your intellect, not only with a judgment, that's what it's primarily, but say natural law, God creates us in such a way that we are oriented to 
going outside of ourselves. Remember, truth, goodness, unity, and beauty. We are created to where we intuitively know I'm not in charge. Maybe never thought of that, but for me, the most there was a philosopher called Rene Descartes, and he said, "I think, therefore I am." There's one thing I'm absolutely sure of is. I'm thinking, so I exist. Even St. Augustine said a thousand years before him, St. Augustine said, he doesn't get credit, but basically he said, even if I doubted my own existence, since a person that doesn't exist can't doubt, even if I doubted that I existed, that shows that I exist. Because the person that doesn't exist can't doubt. All right? So St. Thomas Friday, I'm not quite sure. Augustine said, thousand years before Descartes is the one yeah. famous for, I think, therefore I am. Meaning, I don't know if you guys are real out there. In fact, uh, I might put you to sleep here in another half hour. But I don't know if you're out there or not. I hear you breathing. I don't know if you're out there, but I know I'm experiencing you being out there. So maybe that's not real. Maybe you're not real out there, but I'm perceiving you in here. And so I think, therefore I am. And Pope John Paul II said, not, that's not really the first reality we have. The thing that we are most sure of, well, it's not the first thing that we know. The first thing you know, oh, Jed's a millionaire, we can't know. <laughs> anyway, the first thing you know is not, I think, therefore I am, but I think, therefore I am derived, I am dependent. Because St. Thomas Aquinas says, all knowledge comes through the senses. So. Even a little baby, whenever they have the first awakening of their existence, however that happens, and I'm not sure, not a psychologist or philosopher or anything else, not an expert or anything, if you have to pick that up by now, do that. But the, the only reason I know I exist is that I've had something to bounce it off of. I've already bounced it off of reality out there, and that's why I know I exist. So I think, therefore, I am dependent. So if people focus on that and say, but I get a lot easier than that. There is no one who can be ignorant, no rational person can be ignorant, none, never been one, to, that can be ignorant of the fact that he or she did not choose to be here. Have you ever thought you created yourself? You cannot be wrong about that. You cannot think, you know, I think I brought myself into existence. You cannot be wrong about that. Well, when people say they're pro-choice, thinking that's another contradiction because when somebody is saying pro-choice in a very in-your-face kind of way of course obviously we're for God being pro-choice in the sense that he gives us life freely but we have no right to take a life an innocent life no right but to say pro-choice they're presuming that we should come to agreement that their choices matter so much that we must respect those choices. But think about it. Without God, if somebody says, I, I don't believe in God, I just arrived here. I can't explain how I got here. And since I have, I didn't arrive here by my own free choice, that means basically I could be an accident, but if I reject there's a God, then I'm not, then have to say I'm not lovable. If there is no God who freely and lovingly created me, then my existence is not lovable. I'm not lovable because I was not loved into existence. I'm just happenstance. I just got here. I mean, that's bizarre. But if people want to take it that way, okay. Then if that's what you think, then that means you're not lovable, number one. Number two, since no one created himself or herself, not even God, that God didn't create himself, he's eternal. He never chose to come into existence. In fact, nobody has ever chosen to come into existence. You ever thought of that? No? Should I? Okay, anyway. <laughs> so when people who are here and didn't choose to be here think that we need to be impressed by their individual choices about what they are going to make, all you have to say is, really? Without reverence to reference a reverence of God or reference to God. Huh? You didn't choose to be here, but your choices were supposed individual puny choices. 
In other words, your conscience is less than you, but you think you have to follow your conscience. Bingo. Is your conscience greater than you? No. Then why do you have to follow it? God. Your choices. You don't believe that you chose to be here, right? Please say yes. Yeah? Then why do you think I need to respect your choices? Your choices are individual. They come from you. They're less than you. But you are grounded in zero. You can't, don't even know where you came from. And you didn't have any power over it. So it's hanging on a nothing. Your choices, are, individual choices, are hanging on zilch. And you're not even lovable. Now that's not true. But if you don't believe in God, that's, that's where you have it. That's where you have it. And if you do believe in God, and you're for choice, killing innocent human beings, or other things that are totally against God's will, uh, you're going to have to come to grips with that. Okay, so hypocrisy. I know we're never going to get through this. Anyway, <laughs> hypocrisy is one of the greatest proofs that there is objective truth. Everyone recognizes hypocrisy. But what accounts for the negative response to one whose hypocrisy harms you or society? Only if there is an objective moral order to which everyone is subject can a person's anger towards hypocrisy be justified. Are you with that? Yeah. Hey, that's that's a, so obvious. I believe... Every, everybody's, there is no truth. There's no such thing as truth. Okay, really? There's no such thing as truth. Wow, okay. So why are you upset at that person? Because that person did this. Hey, there's no truth. There's no truth. You, you might, I don't know what you're upset about. If that person, politicians do it all the time. They're always pointing the other side of the aisle. They did this, they love to get in, the media loves to get in, all that stuff. Show people's hypocrisy. I got gotcha. you. Some of the questions are asked, not really necessarily to get to the truth, I think, sometimes. I don't know. But it seems like some of the times the questions that I got from high school when I taught so long, especially with them, was, but what about that? But what about that? But what about that? Father, what about the people in Africa that never heard of Jesus? Or can, can they be saved? Well, I used to not really think they were, oh, well, Tim, are you thinking about being a missionary in Africa? Well, no. Well, then why'd you ask questions? <laughs> because I don't want you, basically, they never taught it. But because I don't want to be held accountable, and I figure if a, most of the world has never heard of Jesus, they've got to go to heaven because it's not their fault. And therefore, yeah, I, if I can go to heaven, basically. It's like, really? Is that the way it is? People need to have a missionary zeal because Jesus Christ wants us to have a conscience so we can be fulfilled, not so we can live a kind of a blase life. He wants us to have life and have it in abundance. And conscience gives us a head start, but it's not enough. Okay, so hypocrisy, that's just an obvious thing. If you ever see somebody that uh, doesn't believe in God, but believes that people ought to, if there is no God, all things are possible, basically. Okay, there is, there is no such thing as right and wrong if, if, if there is no God. Nobody has ever been able to give an explanation why there's right and wrong if there is no God. Absolutely. So if there is somebody who claims to be atheistic, don't believe them. They're not. Have, help them to uncover their, um, that veil over there. Another proof of the objective moral order is the expectations we have of others. We are shocked at those who disappoint us in so many ways. However, there would be no shock where there are no expectations. There would be no expectations if there were no objective norms or purpose in life. There would be no objective norms or purpose were truth only subjective. No, ra and this kind of comes out of just, I just threw it in there. It's not exactly the most logical thing to put right after that sentence, but anyway. No rational human being is totally open to or indifferent to another human being attacking him or her, even if the attacker is following his or her conscience. This reveals the superiority of objective truth but with conscience. When people say, it's my truth, it's my truth. When people say something, you know, I believe all religions are the same. They all, whatever the key, everybody, everybody is equal. It's all equal. Really? So, okay, so let's say you believe everybody's Religious belief is equal. Okay. So what if you ask a person what their religious belief is about what you just said? And that person said, that is asinine. What you just said, saying that all religious beliefs or all moral beliefs are equally valid, I say that's an asinine belief. It's absurd then according to the first person's statement, all religious beliefs or all moral beliefs are equally valid. That person would necessarily be forced to reason, he's not using reason, but he'd be forced to say, that's true. 
What I say is true, all moral thoughts are equal, all religious beliefs are equal. And that person who just said they reject that statement of mine as being absurd, that person's thought is equally valid to mine. Then the very least you could say to that person is, that is absurd, so even if you still can hold both of those things, as absurd as they are, it doesn't even add anything to the conversation. If you wanted to tell us, the reason I believe that is because everything is absurd. There is no truth, and that person, there's no such thing as contradiction. Nobody can live like that. Nobody can live like that. But if somebody wanted to argue that, then even telling somebody there is no truth is absurd because they're wasting their time and energy trying to convince you that life's absurd. Why do that? Why do you need to tell us life's absurd? If it's absurd, it's absurd. We got it. Why are you trying to convince us? Because convincing us would not make it any less absurd, so why waste your time? Are you with me? Yeah? Yeah, okay. All right. That starts to scare me. Okay, the bottom. Jesus Christ is the truth, not our conscience, our hearts. The truth, notice. Now our conscience can be our consciences can be wrong when we are talking about conscience insofar as it's coming to conclusions based on the natural law, which the natural law, bottom line, most profound, cannot be wrong. Natural law and tried in the heart of a person cannot God doesn't plant natural law in some people that's perfect and others it's no. Natural law enables us to gr grasp basic fundamental moral principles. But the ca um, calculating from those, uh, exercising our judgment based on the options that we have and all the circumstances and who's involved and all that, that's where it gets a little cloudy. God understands. We do the best we can to get other experts out, the Bible, the church teaching, and all that. Okay. Here's what St. John says. God is greater than our hearts, and he knows everything. St. Paul says, it is the Lord that judges me, even if his conscience does not accuse him. Whoa! Think about that. I, I got it both ways here. That here, St. Paul saying, even if my conscience doesn't accuse me, God's going to judge me. Now, conscience is going to judge me, but that God is the one that's ultimately going to judge you. And you say, well, wait a minute. If my conscience doesn't accuse me, then I can't know that I'm wrong, so therefore I can't even repent. Well, I won't go into that. I got a little, little bit of time left, but you're only held accountable for what you could have done otherwise. Nothing is, you know, God doesn't expect it impossible. But sometimes people get into um, a hard hearted position, hard hearted position, because they haven't prayed, studied, thought about, cared about others. They haven't listened to the church when they knew that the church was. He who hears me hears you. He, 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 excuse me. he who hears you, Jesus says to the apostle, hears me. Now, Peter found this rock, I built my church. So we're not, I'm not here to judge people. I have no idea. That's God's business. But the Vatican II talks about, and Catechism as well, that what happens, people can become almost, their conscience can almost be blind. To where it can never the spark of light can never go out because you have that natural law that always says seek good, avoid evil. But it can be very difficult after that because if you're never praying, you're not listening to anybody, you're closed off to society, you don't really, you're not living a good life, you're not in a state of grace, then it's going to be more and more difficult for you to see the light that's there. To where it can almost be totally darkened, the intellect and the will totally weak. Never could it go completely out. But then when somebody makes a mistake and should, if they are now in a position to where they don't know that it's wrong, and you say, well, if I don't know it's wrong, I'm not going to be held accountable. Not necessarily. <clears throat> because if the reason you don't know something is wrong is because you are at fault, because you could have known had you tried earlier in your life to do that, then you would be held accountable for what you should have known to the, at the time that you did what you did that was wrong. I know that's a little convoluted, but you can be held accountable for things that you do wrong, even if you're not aware that they're wrong, if in the past 
you haven't done due diligence regarding your conscience, your formation, listen to the appropriate people and all that. So what I'll say about that, go to confession a lot. Uh, okay. Um, uh, on the next page. However, in spite of these more fundamental truths, we will be judged according to our conscience. Meaning God is more important than conscience, but we will still be judged according to our conscience. Because our conscience is the primary means by which we have access to the truth who is the divine person, Jesus Christ, revealing the ultimate reality. St. Thomas Aquinas says, all knowledge comes to the senses, like that maybe sooner or later, he, I, I didn't choose to be here. <laughs> well, whatever, how old he gets. But God is the judge, but he makes it to where he doesn't, he's not working with us one-on-one, -on -one, so we're, we don't have the beatific vision when God Almighty is talking to us. We're not, we're, no. It's our conscience. We get that information through our conscience. Even if Jesus Christ appeared to us right today in the flesh, and we come to be one of the ninth uh, recognized apparitions in the world, it still would entail our conscience accepting that or not. Even in the Bible, Matthew chapter 28, and Jesus rose from the dead, he's about to take off and ascend to heaven. It says, and the apostles were there, and some doubted. Some doubted. What are you talking about? He's risen from the dead. He's about to take off into heaven. And s still these apostles are doubting? They talk about doubting Thomas. I mean, he's been with him 40 days now. Resurrected. Where do you think he's going? Who do you think he is? Anyway, so you, it's not forced. Faith is not forced. You still are going to have to work it through your conscience. God doesn't slam you. He doesn't slam you with his uh, love. God does not bypass our ability to make free, intelligent decisions about our relationship with Him and with others. Our conscience is our unique way of participating in God's providential plan for us to grow in wisdom, age, and grace before the Lord. The truth, who is Jesus Christ, is not imposed on us from without, but is proposed to us accompanied by supernatural truths and the grace necessary to accept Him. Okay, so we're getting down to the theme of this. God, conscience, our voice or God's. The Catechism of the Catholic Church states, deep within his conscience. Man discovers the law. What do we call that law? Natural. natural law. Thank you. Natural law. Which he has not laid upon himself, but which he must obey. Who will lay it on? God is engraved in that heart and of ours. It's voice. Conscience voice. So it's, he says, deep within his conscience. It's voice, meaning conscience is voice. So, ooh, ooh doesn't look like it's God. Uh-oh, looks like it's, it's, his voice, meaning the person. Ever calling him to love and to do what is good and to avoid evil sounds in his heart at the right moment. For man has in his heart a law inscribed by God. His conscience is man's most secret core and his sanctuary. There he is alone with God whose voice echoes in his depths. Furthermore, when he listens to his conscience, the prudent man can hear God speaking. So, I just I can't say it enough times. That's talking about the most fundamental dimension of what we can know. We're created and we immediately know, do good, avoid evil. Do not blowtorch innocent people walking down the street for the fun of it. Do not blowtorch yourself for the fun of it. You just got, life is beautiful. Life is good. Now, when you're unhealthy or you're aged and you're tempted to think, I don't, this is costing so much money. Uh, I wish I was out of my misery. Uh, people don't need me. I'm tempted to take my life. People can get confused. But what you can't get confused about is people do not try to harm themselves when they're having a great time. When people are joyful and they get excited, they're not thinking about doing harm to themselves. Meaning, life in and of itself is, you can't be wrong about it. Life is good. Life is precious. But when you start saying, well, I'm pregnant, and I didn't get there, I was raped, and uh, I'm also I might die as a result of this, and uh, preacher, uh, what should I do? Well, you didn't ask for it, and self-defense, and I guess in that case, although I'm usually against it, uh, people get confused. No, they get confused. So that person could be wrong through no fault of that, that person. We don't judge those persons. But what we have to do is speak the truth. It will set them free. And that's that all life is precious. All life, even even um, uh, our enemy is precious. Even those who do horrible things. Their life is precious because it comes from God. And there's still a spark of um, good in every single human being. Okay. So here it's talking about God's voice. 
Then the next paragraph. The preceding paragraph from the Catechism is balanced by the statement. Conscience is a judgment of reason, whereby the human person recognizes the moral quality of a concrete act that he is going to perform. So which is it, God's voice or a judgment of human reason? And I told you earlier about Pope Benedict the Sixteenth, uh, when he was Cardinal Ratzinger. This is what he said. Prior to his election to the papacy, Cardinal Ratzinger wrote two essays on conscience. In one he states, conscience signifies in some way the voice of God. Notice, in some way within us. With this notion, the completely inviolable character of the conscience is established. In other words, it, uh, you can't attack it. You've got, it's legitimate. In conscience, we have a case that would be above any human law. And conscience is above human, any human law. And they, they'll, you'll hear something say, no, we, you can never force somebody to go against his or her conscience. Well, that's not really true. I'll say, I mean, most of that's true. In almost every situation, that's true. But you can, if somebody wants to do something and they really believe, it's, I'll give you an example. Say there's a, uh, some religious fanatic who believes that God wants them to harm certain people that everybody recognizes besides this person is innocent. And this person really believes that God has ordained him or her to do this. And who are we to know that that's not what they've come to believe? We don't know. We're not sure. We can't, we can't judge what everybody knows and why they know what they know. It's their fault if they, if they came to that conclusion or not. But what we do as a country is say, you're not going to be able to do that. But I'm, I'm commanded to do that. No, you might be, but we're going to stop you. And if we tie that person's hands, put that person in jail to where they can't do freely what they want to do is choke a person, kill a person, whatever, we have stopped them from following their conscience. So religious liberty, freedom to do what you want is limited. And a person's conscience. Now, when you say force them to go against their conscience, maybe you can argue about that. Well, I'm not forcing them. I'm just tying them up. They can still hate the person and will to kill them. No. Uh, so sometimes I hear that and go, yeah, that's stretching a little bit. But for the most part, your conscience is greater than human law. It's not greater than divine law. Eternal law is God's wisdom and his ability and his desire to create a world that his providence will guide and ultimately incorporating our free choices and by his grace in this most mysterious thing that we call predestination in a good way, not in a negative way, but in a good way, that we are chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world and we are the elect. And God's grace will get us there. But then there's human freedom there that where we can be put in the book of life or we can take, be taken out of the book of life. So what's the book of life? Well, it's heaven. Well, then can we be taken out? Yeah. It's not once saved, always saved. But if we do get to heaven, it's primarily because of grace and not our choice. Faith working through love. But God, Jesus Christ says, I have loved you. You have not loved me. I loved you first. I have chosen you. You haven't chosen me. It's always prior. Grace is always prior. We Catholics need to believe that because it's true. Okay, so, Ratzinger, back to him. The fact of such a direct bond between God and man gives man an absolute dignity. But then the question arises, does God speak to men in a contradictory manner? Does he contradict? One must follow one's conscience. However, Jesus, his Holy Spirit, and his body, the church, are the three best ways to ensure that one's conscience is clear. For a Christian, the focus must be on Christ, not on the self. We must not separate or isolate ourselves from Christ and his body, the church. This is the best way for evangelists and catechists to be formed as missionary disciples. So it is appropriate for you to ask people questions, especially people who have been given the authority to teach in the name of Jesus Christ. Whether it's infallible or not infallible, there are various things, we don't have time to go into that, but like any questions about it all. I want to get you out of here on time. Yes? Um, doesn't the conscience evolve over the centuries? Um, for example, um, our forefathers in Hebrews were polygamists, uh -huh. and we're not. Yeah. There's a good question about, just had uh, another priest and I had a discussion about polygamy just the other day, later on, and it was like, well, is that part of natural law or not? And so we could say that when they asked the question of Jesus about marriage, and, and which 
wife is this, uh, which husband is she going to have and all that. Uh, Jesus says, you don't understand. So they're trying to trap him, trying to trap Jesus. And he goes back and the answer he gives is, from the very beginning it was not that way. The two shall become one flesh. So I would say, just like at the beginning it says, in the beginning God created heavens and the earth, the earth was formless waste and the darkness covered the earth by the mighty wind swept over the world. Then God said, let there be light. Then it says, God, singular, and that's it. God said, let us make man, let us, what's this, let us stuff? This one God, and this one God, let us. So it's giving you a little whiff of, hmm, hmm, this God is one, but he's also not isolated. Okay? But you can only read back when you're in the New Testament. Jesus says, I come from the Father. And they go, hey, you're blaspheming, there's only one God. Let us. Okay? So, polygamy. Uh, there, believe me, it only happens uh, after the, the first sin, okay? It only happens after that. And then, basically, you see throughout the Old Testament that polygamy is causing huge problems, okay? If you, if you kind of see beyond the um, surface. But when Jesus responds and he says, he takes it back, the two shall become one flesh. Well, two can't become one flesh if you become one flesh with somebody else at the same time, one flesh, one flesh. But then in the New Testament, it's abundantly clear when it talks about husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. And in Mark's Gospel, chapter 10, talks about um, divorce and remarriage, whether you can do that. And it's talking about this monogamy. Monogamy. So, uh, but you talk about culture. Cultures can be wrong. They can be wrong. People can be wrong. But not at the basic principles. They can't be wrong at the basic principles. Even... Uh, all throughout. They, all societies have some kind of understanding that they're derived and dependent and they're kind of making sacrifices. Sometimes they do the wrong kind of sacrifices to appease the gods, obviously. Uh, but uh, individual cultures can be wrong, but it can't be wrong on the absolute basics. But, but our conscience tells us, when people say all truth is relative, well if all truth is relative, you could put up some of those things like, what about when they sacrifice little children to that? That's horrible! I thought all truth was relative. All truth is relative, right? Well, so why would that make that? If it works for them, it works for them, right? Well, no. Okay. Then you're making a judgment that there is a truth above what they're doing. And you're criticizing them, and you want to correct them. Because why? Because you have a truth that they don't have, and you're willing to share it and correct them. Okay? So, but cultures can be wrong. It can also be, uh, they're not informed. I mean, the Old Testament, they didn't have the fullness of truth. Jesus Christ comes, and he's going to reveal to them the fullness of truth. Whether they're held accountable, I've had to deal with that as far as um, what the people in the Old Testament could have known and should have known and what people in the New Testament have, because God doesn't change. But it's kind of difficult to explain uh, how you interpret what, what is inspired Word of God. I'll give you one example. When the Bible says, okay, it says, every word in the Bible is inspired by God. We believe that. God inspires every single word. So every word is inspired. Okay, but... If every word is inspired, does that mean that every statement in the Bible is true? Well, uh, yes, yeah, because it's in the Bible. Okay. Well, when the devil says something to somebody in the Bible, when the devil is speaking, is that, and it's in the Bible, and the devil is speaking, is that God's word, or is it the devil's word? It's both. It's the devil's word. God is not inspiring the devil to say what the devil says. God is inspiring the author to write what the devil said. Okay? So when we say God inspires the Bible, and he inspired, you know, every word is inspired. It is. But it's not inspired like God is telling everybody, say these words. The devil starts talking like this. And say this word, and the stupid people start talking like this. Uh, no, these people have freedom. God inspires the authors to write down that part of what he could be doing is showing ignorance in the Old Testament about what he wanted done. God didn't always want done what the people said that God wanted done. Okay? In the New Testament, and that's why you need a church. Say, so, well, which ones are they? I mean, the earrings, should I wear earrings or hairdo like this? Or is that something that's permanent or uh, social? That's why you need a church. The culture, I, I mean, I've got, I've got a book right here that gets into about an hour worth of the cultural and three different things that I don't want to bring up since it's three different centers. 
I hope I gave you some kind of insight into a lot of stuff. Thank you. Thank you.